Good morning, and welcome to St. John's on the first Sunday of Advent. I'm the Reverend Gia Hayes Martin, the Rector of St. John's. A special welcome to anyone who's a guest of our community this morning. We're glad you're here, and we hope you find something at St. John's that feeds your soul. If you're worshiping with us on YouTube and you'd like the link to worship on Zoom, please fill out the form on the Contact Us section of our website, stjohnsworthington.org. You will want either a copy of the Order of Service or a Book of Common Prayer to help you follow along with our worship this morning. The Order of Service can be downloaded on our website, and it was also in the email sent out to the parish on Friday. Now let us enter into a brief moment of silence as we prepare to worship God. Come, O Holy One, as the morning light after a wakeful night. Keep us mindful that at any moment you may ask of us an accounting of our lives. Help us to love you and love one another in all we do. And so clothe us with your light that we may bring others to love you also. Through Jesus our Savior. Amen.
We're experiencing some technical difficulties. We had to reset the router. Uh, this should fix the intermittent audio sounds that you were getting. Do you want to do the hymn again? It is on. We are going to try again with the hymn and hope that it comes through better. Please feel free to um, let me know in the chat because this is a wonderful Advent hymn. We need to make sure we can hear it.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah 64, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. When fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived. No eye has seen any God besides you who works with those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned, because you hid yourself we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the land of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord. Do not remember iniquity forever. 
Now consider we are all your people. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Hear us, O King of Israel, who shepherds Joseph very well, and like a flock you care for him, enthroned between the cherubim. Shine forth before your people in Manasseh from Benjamin. Awaken in your righteous might, and come to save us in your light. Restore us, God, and make your face to shine upon us by your grace. Restore us, God, that we may be forever saved eternally. O Lord, the God of hosts, how long will you be angry and prolong your wrath against your people's prayers, whom you have fed with bread of tears? For you have made us drink our tears, and with our neighbors strive with fears. Now all our enemies around, mark us with scorn, our lives confound. Restore us, God, and make your face to shine upon us by your grace. Restore, Almighty God, that we may now be saved eternally. Your vine is caught and burned with fire, at your rebuke we all expire. Let your hand rest upon the man, the Son of Man at your right hand. Then we will never turn away from you who are our strength and stay. Revive us, Lord, and we will call upon your name to save us all. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been encircled, enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that out day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Back in March, as lockdowns were beginning and everyone was looking for things to do while stuck at home, one of the most frequently downloaded songs on iTunes was a classic from 1987, REM's It's the End of the World as We Know It and I Feel Fine. It spoke to the moment we were in. I like REM, though I've always found their lyrics a little nonsensical. That song is typical Generation X irony. Most people don't look on the end of the world as a good thing, something to feel okay about. You ask about the end of the world and the feelings you'll hear about are terror, dread, despair. But REM is onto something with their secular Advent hymn. This season in the church's year is about the end of the world as we know it, and we can feel fine about it, better than fine. Nobody had heard of R.E.M. 2,500 years ago, but the song would have resonated with the people of Judah, the people Isaiah is writing to. This prophet is the third to use the name Isaiah. He's usually called Third Isaiah. His people have been through a brutal time. Their kingdom of Judah was gradually conquered by the empire of Babylon. By the time its domination was complete, Babylon had blinded Judah's king, killed the rest of the royal family, destroyed the city of Jerusalem and its temple, and carried off Judah's political and religious leaders into exile. Everything that made Judah Judah, their independence, their community, the temple, which was the only place God could be worshipped, the line of kings de descended from David, the land itself, it was all gone. After 40 years, Babylon was conquered by Persia, and the Persian Empire let the exiles go home, back to Judah. This was what the exiles had been longing for, but their country was in shambles. The returning exiles met a community that had stayed put. The experience of conquest had changed everybody, but they were moving in different directions. The two sides resented each other and disagreed vehemently about re rebuilding. And Persia now held all the power. The people of Judah were allowed to live in their land, but they had no control over it. 
It was a mess, and they didn't see a way out. To third Isaiah, the path forward is the end of the world. He doesn't seem to know exactly what is wrong, whether God's anger made the people sin or whether God had hidden God's self and without God's guidance, the people had sinned. What third Isaiah does know is to cry out to God for help. Third Isaiah pleads to God to act as God has acted in the past, to tear open the heavens and come down, to make other nations tremble at God's presence, the way they had when God had freed the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt. Because God has acted like this before, third Isaiah is confident that God will act like this now. The prophet uses this wonderful image of a potter shaping clay. When the clay goes awry on the wheel, the potter starts again. He puts the clay back into an unformed lump, works it to squeeze out the air bubbles, and throws the clay again, forming it into something new. It's the end of the world and the beginning of a new world. For third Isaiah, this act of reshaping and renewal is profoundly hopeful. It is the opportunity to get it right this time, for God to take away the pain and sorrow and suffering of this world and create a world of peace, harmony, wholeness. A world without foreign domination and internal conflict, a world where all of Judah's people can live and worship and thrive together in their own land. It's the end of the world as third Isaiah knows it, and he feels fine, more than fine, encouraged, optimistic even, because God is making all things new. Not quite 2,000 years ago, in the time of the gospel writer Mark, God's people had again been through a brutal time. This is our first Sunday with the Gospel of Mark. We'll be hearing him for the next year. Mark is the earliest of the Gospels in the Bible. Most scholars believe he was writing between the years 68 and 73 of the Common Era, about 40 years after Jesus' lifetime. In the first century, the Roman Empire occupied the land that is now Israel and Palestine. Jews were allowed to practice their faith as long as they accepted Roman domination. In the year 66, tensions between Jews and Rome exploded into a Jewish revolt against the empire. Then Jewish factions began fighting among themselves, and Rome sent an army to put down the revolt with merciless efficiency. In the year 70, the Romans besieged Jerusalem for seven months, trapping hundreds of thousands of Jews inside the city. The Romans finally breached the walls, ransacked the city and burned it, demolished the temple, carried the temple treasures off to Rome in triumph, and enslaved the Jews who survived the siege. The rebels fought on in the rural areas, but within three years, Rome had crushed the revolt. We don't know exactly where Mark and his community were located, whether they were Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians or both, but this great trauma affected them powerfully. The world as they knew it was broken by battle, starvation, enslavement, defeat, and humiliation. What would Jesus say to them? What would he do in this hurting world? When Mark describes great suffering, the sun darkened, the moon not giving its light, the stars falling from heaven, the powers in heaven shaken, He's talking about things that have already happened. He's not predicting the future. He's describing the recent past. Mark's Jesus, the Son of Man, promises to act as God the Father has acted in the past. Jesus will come with power and glory to remake this broken world. He will gather up those who have been scattered and bring them home. Where there has been violence and suffering, Jesus will bring peace harmony, wholeness. He's so near that he is at the city gates, just about to arrive. All Mark and his community have to do is pay attention to the signs and keep alert, keep awake. For Mark, as for third Isaiah, 
This is profoundly hopeful. The world as Mark knows it has ended. Jesus is reshaping and remaking a new world. This is more than fine. It's reassuring. It's promising. Through Jesus, God is making all things new. The season of Advent has two faces. It looks backward to Jesus' birth in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, and it looks forward to Jesus coming again to make all things new. Advent, more than any other season, acknowledges the brokenness of this world. And it holds out the promise that whenever the world is hurting, whenever the powers of this world hold people down, Whenever conflict and suffering shatter the hearts of God's people, God makes all things new. God led the Israelites from slavery into freedom. God guided the people of Judah to rebuild their temple and their country. God strengthened Mark's community to endure persecution and change the world. God will do the same for us. We'd like the world to be remade in an instant. Jesus descends from the clouds, God throws a few lightning bolts, and poof, everything is fixed. Yet the process of renewal is as slow as the birth of a child. The new world gestates for centuries. The labor pains last for years. The changes can be so subtle that we don't notice them as they're happening. Yet through Jesus... God is already making all things new. Like a potter scraping misshapen clay off the wheel to reform it into something better, God is at work in this broken world to heal it, restore it, and recreate it. We see the signs. Neighbors checking in on each other. Phone calls and Zoom chats with distant friends that help us feel less alone. People giving up their holiday celebrations to protect others they may never meet. So we keep alert, keep awake for Jesus to come again. We don't really know what the world will be like when we finally emerge from the difficult winter ahead. This experience of pandemic will change us as conquest and exile changed the people of Judah, as the revolt changed Mark's community. We do know that God is faithful and God is working to restore this broken world. And that gives us profound hope for the future. It is the end of the world as we know it, and we might feel fine, better than fine. For through Jesus Christ, God is coming to make all things new. We affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshiped and glorified. 
She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please join me in the prayers for the people. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Thomas, Ken, and Nettie, our own bishops, for all bishops and other ministers, and for the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be one as you and the Father are one, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness, it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray to you, Lord, our Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow up among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray especially for Phil and Elaine, Bishop Bridenthal, Jackie and family, Harriet, Denise, Lee, Andy, Martha, John, Vicki, Bob and family, Chris, Nicholas, Lucy, Margaret, Linda, Bostwick, and family, Jane, Nicole. Are there others? We pray for our service men and women and all first responders. We pray for those impacted by the coronavirus pandemic here and throughout the world. We pray for all who, ex who experience fear or exclusion. We pray for those in prison or bondage, in body or spirit. For those who have died in communion of your church and for those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but eter life eternal, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. We give thanks to all, for all the blessings of this life, especially for the people of St. John's and for their memories, their mysteries, <laughs> ministries, of course. We give thanks for those celebrating birthdays this week. O oh God, our times are in your, in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. 
Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed John, and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, O Lord our God. Hasten, O Father, the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer for spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. Since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Good morning again. A couple of announcements to highlight this week. Coffee and Conversation begins a series on spiritual practices for Advent. We'll do this for the next four weeks, learning some prayer practices that we can take into our own prayer lives. We're going to focus on the theme of the Annunciation, which is a kind of classic Advent story, the angel Gabriel announcing to Mary that she will bear the child Jesus. And it's also one that many artists and musicians and writers have found inspiration in. So it gives us a lot to work with. Today, we will use uh, Ignatian prayer, a way of drawing the imagination into prayer that was popularized by Ignatius Loyola back in the 16th century. Stay in the Zoom meeting after the service and after coffee hour, and coffee and conversation will begin about 11.15 or 11.20. We continue to receive signups for the Giving Tree, which helps provide Christmas gifts to students at Kilbourne Middle School and their families who need a little bit of help at this time of year. We still have about six children who have not received any signups for gifts yet. Uh, so please uh, use the Sign Up Genius link that is in this week's announcements to uh, choose a gift or two that you will uh, purchase and bring to St. John's for that child. Uh, you can also purchase gift cards, um, shop online if that's more comfortable for you. Uh, the Outreach and Social Justice team will be meeting people here on Wednesday afternoons and again on Saturday afternoons for uh, no contact gift drop off uh, for those of you who would like to take advantage of that. The deadline for all the gifts is December 12th. Uh, we would really like to have as many signups as possible this week so the Outreach and Social Justice Committee knows where they stand. Uh, so please sign up for that. The link is in this week's announcements. And there's much more going on at St. John's. So please uh, look at the announcement sheet that it was sent out on Friday. May the sun of righteousness shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and always. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>